day. I'm Ranger Naomi Boak, and I'm here on the Lower River, uh, Brooks River in Katmai National Park. And um, not a view you usually see, but it's very windy here today. So we're going to try to make this so you can hear us. Yeah, we'll try. Okay. So today um, we're talking bears, bats, and biology with Dr. Michael Satson, who is a wildlife biologist here in Katmai National Park. Um, so um, we know that Dr. Saxon has been doing research on uh, brown bears for a long time. And research on wild bears is no easy task, especially here, he laughs. You like darting 856, huh? Well, I mean, it's everything, I suppose. Uh, his, his response is interesting. <laughs> so it's not an easy task here um, because we don't collar our bears. Um, they're, you know, tracked by sight. And um, so it, it's a it's a tough thing to study. So today um, we're going to uh, discuss with Michael about um, genetics um, and hibernation, and um, we're also going to talk about another interesting creature that is hard to study, which is the bat. And um, Michael's going to explain to us why bats are so fascinating so that we can be interested in more than bears. That sounds great. Okay. So welcome, Michael. Well, thank you very much, and hello, Internet. <laughs> um, so for us, you know, it's a, it's always a highlight to be able to talk to you. Um, you know, everyone's always curious about your work and what you think about um, what's happening with the bears. So first, can you explain to us what your job is here sure. in, in, during the season? Sure, yeah. So I'm a wildlife biologist for Katmai National Park. Um, a large portion of my job during the summer is running the bear management team. So that's here at Brooks Camp, you know, the, the standard keeping bears out of uh, our, our supposed bear free zone over there in camp. Um, but then we also have bear viewing areas throughout the rest of the park. And so we're trying to keep a handle on how people and bears are interacting in those areas. And uh, make sure that everybody's um, I also do a lot of GIS work, uh, which is uh, geographic information systems. Uh, and we've got all sorts of other projects for uh, most of our management related. Um, so we've got, we've had a lot of things going on this summer. We've had, yeah, we have bat work. We've always got our surveys going on. And uh, Leslie Score, another wildlife biologist, she runs a lot of those. Um, we've got, so when you say surveys, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so we're trying to monitor a bunch of different species out here. We've got brown bears. We do stream surveys and sedge meadow surveys. Uh, we do moose surveys in the, later in the fall. We've got uh, bald eagle nest surveys that we conduct every year. Um, then there's also some ones that, that Leslie started working on this year. We've got uh, marine debris surveys where we're looking at, at trash that washes up from the ocean, um, trying to get a sense of whether or not how much of that is accumulating on the coastline. Uh, and then we've also got uh, like seabird mortality surveys as well, looking for mass die off events along the coast. Yeah, that's a lot. There are a lot of projects. Yeah, Leslie, like I said, Leslie's running a lot of those, uh, the survey side of things. Um, I'm, I tend to stick around more on the management side, uh, especially during the summer and then the- uh, which, yeah. which includes bear management and yes. people management. Yes, yeah, people management tends to be a large portion of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, um, for those bear cam viewers who have been with us for a while um, and for new ones, um, you were doing um, a genetic study mm -hmm. to uh, find out the relationship between bears in here and bears in other locations Correct. in the park. And some people know that um, the that study didn't quite turn out the way you wanted it to. Um, it did not turn out the way that they, a lot of people wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just it, briefly explain sure. what your goals and what happened? so that we, we don't get a lot of questions about um, who are Otis's children. Sure, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so the, the intention of the study was to look at gene flow throughout Katmai National Park. We were primarily looking at uh, the, the relatedness between bears in the interior, places like Brooks Camp, and bears out on the coast, places like Howa Bay, Geographic Harbor. Um, we wanted to know, so the, the, uh, the Aleutian Mountain Range bisects the park, we want to know how much movement there is across that mountain range. Are the bears that are in Brooks Camp, are they going over to the elevation? And back over here, are they that perspective, uh, we got enough samples. Uh, we were able to do that analysis. And it's 
said that uh, there is actually some genetic isolation between the coast of the park and the interior, which was pretty surprising. The mountain range is not big enough to stop bears from moving back and forth. Uh, so the only reason that or my primary hypothesis on why we wouldn't see uh, more movement back and forth is just that we have these really great food resources on one side, we have these really great food resources on the other side, and not so much in the middle. So yeah, just, so why bother? Yeah, why go back and forth? Yeah. Um, so that seems to that's my guess as to why we don't see all that much movement, and that fits with um, you know we did have some collared bears out on the, the coast of the park right. in uh, was that you know say 15 through 17. Um, and none of those bears were documented moving. They would go up to the to the ridge line occasionally, and then go back down on the same side that they had come up on. Um, so that fit with that data. I'm sure there has to be some movement back and forth between the two, uh, but as far as uh, enough to, it wasn't enough to eliminate any um, any genetic differentiation between those populations. So, and I know that a lot of CAM viewers were very interested to see if we could find out. Um, relationships between bears on the river, yeah. and that's the part that didn't it did happen. not go so well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so several reasons for that. One is just in order to really get a good uh, lineage map of the bears here, we would need to get samples from almost every individual. We would know. We would need to know who those samples were from. So we were collecting data in a couple different ways. One was biopsy darks, which Naomi mentioned earlier. Um, um, uh, so those were using a CO2 powered rifle, shooting a dart at a bear, but instead of tranquilizing them, it bounces out, it takes a little tissue sample, and we can use that for our genetic analysis. Uh, there you go. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> uh, another thing that we were doing was we had uh, around some of the rub trees. So there you go, they rub on the tree, they would just put the bear on the tree. So first of all, it would be very tough. We found it to be harder than I originally thought it was going to be to get samples from all the bears. Um, I need them to come near one of our elevators in order for me to dart them. You mean they don't come when you call them? They're close. I've got them this close to being trained. <laughs> this close. Um, but sadly, they won't quite yet. Um, but yeah, so, so I had thought, well, I see these bears all the time. This won't really be that big of a challenge. But some of them don't really come right next to our viewing platforms right when I need them to. Like 856. Uh, like 856. He did the one time. Uh, unfortunately, the one time he did, uh, the darts I was using at the time were, I was having a pretty high failure rate. So it was hitting them and bouncing out. later on. Uh, but then we also had some issues with some of our samples were lost, uh, which was a really big bummer. Um, you know, science is run by human beings and people make mistakes. And unfortunately, in this case, I shipped those samples out and at some point in the process, they got lost. Um, so yeah, that was 2018. That was my biggest year of dark. So we lost a lot of samples right here. And as a result, we did not get samples from the here and at Hallow and other places. Um, how would the park use that information? Well, so, I mean, it's it's always useful when we're looking at how we manage bears. Do we, we need to know if we're managing one population or if we're like managing multiple populations. Uh, a, an easy to understand and easily digestible way to, to think about that is the preserve. So that's another area that we were looking. In the preserve, there's a hunt. Um, there's a brown bear hunt. And so we need to know if that population is connected to the other populations around and how it's connected so that we can know when we're, you know, when we're advising the state um, as far as how they're managing that hunt, um, whether or not those populations are all connected. Okay. So um, I know that you are deeply interested and passionate about the genetics and biology of hibernation. Mm -hmm. And because I like you so much, I'm going to indulge you <laughs> today, and we're going to talk about that. That sounds great. Okay, yeah. <laughs> because I'm also really curious uh -huh. about it because hibernation is this phenomenon we can't do it we just not do yet it. at least 
<laughs> <Not yet. laughs> we try sometimes i do the opposite hibernation uh -huh. i get fat in the winter okay and i lose weight in the summer okay. i would not do well okay well that's estivation uh okay. yeah yeah it's the opposite of hibernation you sleep it's off during the summer. yeah oh, so okay. there's ground squirrels in california they estivate because it's hot i'll have, so I'll have to go. move to california yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> so um what are some of the unique um biological and metabolic um characteristics that enable bears to hibernate and that means you know be without food um not urinate not defecate oh, mm -hmm. um and um and be tucked in cozy for the winter yeah so so the, the question is how are they doing that yeah metabolically and biologically what great question uh, <laughs> and you don't know um yeah, we know we know parts of it, okay. uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to hibernation. Um, so we're talking specifically bears here, right? It's okay, just bears. Just bears. So there's there was this. and these small mammals like squirrels and stuff and they're like you know they're dropping their body temperature down to zero pretty much and bears don't do that bears drop their body temperature maybe six degrees celsius or so they go from like 37 degrees celsius down to about 31 degrees celsius um and so a lot of the early researchers are looking at this like this is a nation this is just, this is just winter tour. there are still some people who debate this um there have been papers that have talked about bears as the best hibernators on the planet because of what they're doing I don't actually care whether people call it hibernation. Um, and yeah, they're, they're dropping their heart rate, they're dropping their respiration rate, they're dropping their body temperature, uh, metabolic rate goes down. Uh, and as you mentioned, yeah, they're not, generally, they're not eating or drinking, urinating or defecating throughout the course of the, of the, of the winter. Um, if a human didn't, didn't urinate for six months, uh, yeah. And if yeah. we got that fat, we'd be what we call obese, and we'd have some serious problems like diabetes, oh. potentially. Yeah, and how bears are able to do some of those health concerns is unknown. So some of the ones that really interest me a lot are um, like muscle and bones. Uh, when, when if a human, so NASA has actually done some they paid a pretty good amount of money to stay in bed for a long period of time. And if a human stays in bed, Really important, so NASA paid for it because of space travel and people that are right. in uh, microgravity for an extended period of time. But then it's also important for people that are put on bed rest and stuff like that. Uh, people that are in wheelchairs for extended periods of time. Uh, these this this matters for a lot of a lot of medical reasons for people. Uh, bears, when they go into the, the den and they spend six months in hibernation, then they lose about so we're, we're losing. How they're able to do it is still very much an open question. There are several several theories. There are several um, lines of evidence that suggest one thing or another, but, um, but we really don't know how it is that they're doing it. And similarly with uh, with uh, like heart disease, bears, bears get a hardening of the, the uh, chambers of the heart and the wall of the heart when they're in hibernation. And if you know something like that happens, that's a really bad sign. Yeah. Heart disease is, is a very serious thing. And, with bears, spring rolls around, and it just goes back to normal. And we don't know about that. Is there a um, guys have questions, if you can put it into the bear cam um, uh, spreadsheet for questions, and if we have time, we'll get to them at, at the end. No questions about who are Otis's children. <laughs> Anything else you can ask. Um, so, I mean, is there any promising research that, you know, that points in a direction or two for any of these aspects of bear physiology? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of promising research, and not, not, all, not all of it is particularly recent. I mean, there are things that people did 20 years ago that are the best evidence that we've got so far for some of the hypotheses. Um, there's, there are several people 
that are working on it ongoing. I mean, the lab that I came through at Washington State University, they're still working on a lot of the, the diabetes side of it. Um, there are several other researchers at Washington State University had a researcher that was doing a lot of uh, work that I think he is no longer, um, he's no longer working on that project. Uh, Fairbanks, University of Alaska Fairbanks has some researchers that have been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of pretty unique hibernation research, although most of that's not on bears. They do have some work on black bears up there. Um, is there a, um, I mean, what difference in terms of hibernation is there for black bears and brown bears in Alaska, say? I mean, I don't want to talk about black bears sure. in Florida. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a fairly sim similar mechanism. I'm sure there are differences, but I'm not aware of what they are uh, as far as differences in mechanisms for black bears and brown bears. Yeah, if we're staying within similar uh, similar climate regimes. Yeah. Right. So um, I'm curious about um, the genetics of hibernation. Okay. I mean, um, what is it um, in a bear's um, genetic makeup that that helps it hibernate? Okay, you're going to give me another opportunity to give my favorite answer here, which is I have I no know. idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's possible that paper is out there. Um, I'd have to look again to see whether or not people have looked specifically at transcriptomics of hibernation in bears. So looking rather than at the, the genes themselves, looking at the RNA, so looking at how those genes are in the RNA uh, and the protein um, and what differences there were there between hibernation and hibernation. A lot. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so um, we looked at three tissues in particular. We were looking at uh, muscle, liver, and adipose tissue, so fat. Um, we chose those three tissues because we are we were primarily interested in the diabetes side of the story, and those are three important tissues. Um, so to put that in context, 5,000 genes. Um, there are about 32,000 genes that are regularly expressed that we that we find and know about uh, at this point in time. Um, and when looking between humans and chimpanzees, it's about 5,000 genes that are differentially expressed between humans and chimpanzees. So within a single individual, we're seeing a level of change in expression that's similar to the change in species. Season. For yeah, for a different season, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, our genes are fairly well. Uh, it's really not going to change a whole lot. Of course, mutations are arising all the time. Our cells are really good at stopping mutations from arising. But when you think about how you know, in every single cell in your body, mutations arise all the time. Um, so there is some modification that occurs, but it's not just about the genes. Yeah, it's about how those genes are then reared. R, that RNA is turned into proteins. There's epigenetics. There's all sorts of things that occur um, that can that can affect uh, what those genes do. And so easy to study in bears. Oh, super easy. Yeah, it was very simple. <laughs> <laughs> We're joking, guys. <laughs> We're joking. Um, so, um, what, if you were to feed a bear in winter who was used to hibernating, uh -huh. would that change the expression of its genes at all? Would it change its behaviors? Um, oh, both interesting questions and both things that I did during my PhD. Uh -huh. um, well, not not directly for mine, but yeah, we, we, did, uh, we did some of that work. So we fed bears um, pure glucose Ooh. for a little while during hibernation. Hot shots. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it was not as many calories as they would normally get you know, during active season or anything like that. Um, and I'm trying to remember, but so 
so we did see an increase in activity. Uh, increase in activity. And we also saw uh, an increase in, I want to say we saw an increase in metabolic rate to a certain extent. Maybe uh, it must have been body temperature that we, that we were measuring. So we saw an increase in body temperature. Not all the way back up to active season, though. So even when we're feeding them and stuff, they're not. And I guess that was so the first year we get 50% of the cow. The second year we get 100% of the And no matter, even when we gave them 100% of the calories, uh, they still weren't going all the way back up to their active season physiology. Uh, so feeding them does seem to awaken them to a certain extent but not all the way back up to what they would normally be experiencing during active season. And that fits with some other studies that have been done um, that have found that, that bears that are getting food during the winter, um, yeah, they may be more active, um, their body temperature is gonna increase, their metabolic rate's gonna increase, but they're not necessarily all the way back up to what they are during the summer. So um, I wanted to put uh, some of that um, into context with the season here at uh, the river. I mean, one, thing we saw was um, everything seemed like two weeks happening two yeah, weeks yeah. later right then then we're used to it was a long cold winter um, a lot of snow a lot of snowpack and their stands are under snowpack are there certain signals um, stretch time to pick up and oh yeah i've been walking around but time to go to the river where i know there's food uh okay so i won't fully give you my favorite answer there so we we don't we don't really know but there are uh there was a really great study uh out by the scandinavian group it must have been three or four years ago uh, and they looked at a bunch so they had heart rate monitors and bears collars on them. They were looking at a bunch of different things, looking at activity levels, uh, body temperature, um, heart rate, heart rate variability, ambient temperature uh, around the dens. They were looking at a bunch of different things. And um, they found that an entrance seemed to be dictated more by environmental conditions. And then it was more dictated by uh, physiological cues. Hmm. Um, that kind of a larger picture of research that's been done over the years um we really we don't know what triggers them to go into the den so we do know that body temperature starts to decrease uh before and heart rate starts to decrease before they actually go into the den generally but it's really right around the first snowfall that, and, and by most bears will, will enter the dens uh, which suggests that there is something in that environmental cue uh maybe it's temperature maybe it's the snow itself we don't know um but the caveat here is a researcher a long time ago, very different uh, standards of animal care back then. Um, <laughs> but he took some black bears and attempted to send them into hibernation in the summer by putting them into a freezer, essentially. He put them oh. in a freezer and, uh, and regulated the light temperature. So that it mimicked, um, you know, winter time, light conditions, winter time temperatures, uh, tried to. Like I said, very different time, very okay. different standards of care. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so ultimately though, it's a very interesting bit of information because what we found there is that it's not just environmental cues. There is some sort of internal mechanism that is telling them, hey, now is the time to be looking out for these environmental cues. And now, okay, now we've got this, we've got the, the physiological cues and the environmental cues working together, sending them into hibernation or waking them up. So not literally, but um, like a, a clock rather than, um, oh, gee, there's still a lot of snow out there. I'm going to stay in my den. Yeah, so probably a combination of the two. I mean, we know that uh, when you get a warm day out, some bears will come out of the den and they'll look around and see if there's any food available. Uh, so that can happen in January. You might have a day where it's just strangely warm and bears might come out and kind of take a look around and see what's going on. 
Um, but there is definitely, so yeah, you talk about a clock, it's a lot of people have probably heard of circadian rhythms, you know, the, the sort of the body's clock throughout the day. Um, there's what we call circannual rhythms, which is the body's clock throughout the year mm. as well. Uh, and so there's possibly something going on there with circannual rhythms. So what areas of research on bears are you most excited about? What's what's out there in the future that you really want to find out about and, and that we might be able to find out about? Oh, I mean, all these things that we're talking about, I think that we have, that we could find out about all these things. There are people that are actively looking into it. Um, and I mean, everything that we're talking about now are the things that I tend to be most excited about. Hibernation physiology is so cool. Um, how any animal is able to do this and how all different animals that hibernate these different suites of physiological characteristics in order to survive winter is super cool. Um, and then you add on to that the the human impacts. Uh, and as much as I'll talk about the medical side, I'm a huge space nerd, so the whole NASA side is really cool to me as well. <laughs> I think we have a lot of space nerds among, among your fans, okay, so cool. that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so the, the implications for space travel are also quite bad. Um, you know, there was a point in my life where I might have said yes, but uh, I, I have uh, I have uh, family, and I don't think I'm ready for a one-way trip to to another planet right now. But yeah, maybe your son will want to do that. Maybe in the future. Maybe. So, um, so I wanted to talk um, about another species of wildlife okay. here in Katmai that you're very excited about, and that's bats. And why should we get excited about bats? I mean, aren't bats a pain in the neck and, you know, scary and, and you know, uh, why should we love bats? You know, there are, there are unfortunately a lot of people that think that bats are very scary and, uh, and a nuisance. Um, I couldn't disagree with them. So uh, we had a researcher here that, you know, who was doing all this work with us recently, and she did a comparison that I really loved. She did this whole, this whole presentation bats as flying rodents. They're, they're flying mice. Um, and so she did a comparison. She looked at it and she's like, look, um, you know, how, how long do mice live? A couple years? A very short lifespan. Yeah. Um, how long do bears live? 20, 30 years? Yeah. Something. Little brown bats, which is the only species that we have here in the park, these little browns, um, they've been documented to live up to 30 years in the wild. Um, normally, with small animals, you expect them to have shorter lifespans. That is a very reasonable expectation. The vast majority of things, that's true. Little brown bats seem to be an exception to that. So they can live 30 years. Little brown bats hibernate in the winter. Yes. Just like our bears do. Yeah. Um, in, in a lot of ways that she kept, she kept kind of pulling it back. She's like, they're not flying mice, they're flying bears. Uh, <laughs> there you go. People. Yeah, they're flying bears. There's <laughs> a major reason to love bats. They are flying mm -hmm. bears. That's it. QED. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Done. So, um, so what kind of research um, are are you guys doing on bats here? So what we're doing here is uh, very entry level, trying to understand anything about the bats here. So bats in Alaska have been were overlooked for a very long time up until about 20 years ago in the last 20 years people have started to pay a little bit of attention to them but even that's been mostly down in the southeast um, up until we started doing this work we didn't know what species exist we still don't really know what species exist out here. we know that we've only documented little brown bats um, there are seven documented species in alaska uh, all of the other six have only been documented in the southeast at this point. How, uh, how many um, species of bats are there? Oh gosh, uh, a lot. I don't. I don't know the <laughs> Wait, answer. Wait, are to that. we in thousands, hundreds? Uh, thousands. I'm pretty sure we're in, pretty sure we're in thousands. Uh, yeah, there are there are a lot of bats out there. Right? I should fact check you on that. I don't, I don't remember exactly. They will. Yeah, they will. They will fact check you. Um, there are a lot of bats. People get really scared of bats. A lot of people think of vampire bats. Um, vampire bats are not real. They do exist. Uh, there are very few 
two species of vampire bats. None of them exist in Alaska, uh, unfortunately. I would love to work with vampire bats. They're really cool. Um, and none of them are going to like you know drain your blood dry. There's one species that will that will um, use humans for a food source. Uh, kind of like our mosquitoes here. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, like from what I understand of it, I am not a bat expert, and I'm not a vampire bat expert. From what I understand of it, most of the time the animals that are getting bitten don't even actually know they're getting bitten. It happens while they're sleeping and they generally don't wake up as a result of it. It does not turn them into vampire bats. Um, <laughs> or vampires. Or, or vampires, yeah. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's not, not generally uh, as big of an issue as it may have to be. Um, really what people are most worried about with bats is the rabies. Um, and you know, that's, it's, it is something to be aware of. A lot of different wildlife species can carry rabies. Bats are certainly capable of carrying rabies. Um, the incidence of rabies in bats is wildly overblown. Uh, it's about 1% of bats who carry, will carry rabies. Um, and and they don't, you know, it's not like with what people think of with dogs and stuff. Where you're, you're going to get rabid and get... Or um, like raccoons. That raccoons they, right. Yeah, yeah, start frothing at the mouth and become very aggressive. Generally, we don't see that with bats. Uh, they might be behaving abnormally. They might be flying during the day. Not every bat that flies during the day has rabies. Um, but they might start behaving abnormally. Uh, so it is something to be aware of. But in general, it's it's not uh, it's not as common as people seem to think it is. Here in Alaska, uh, lots of people are more likely to have rabies than bats are. Um, but, uh, but all of them are pretty unlikely to be. So... Um... You know, so we talked about how difficult it is to study bears. I mean, you know, at least maybe you can, you know, watch them for a while. I mean, bats are not readily seen, all right? Yeah, so it depends on what you want to do. Uh, what we've been doing, so we started to talk about what we've been doing, doing something, right. we didn't really get there. Uh, uh, yeah, so we're looking at the, sort of the, uh, what bats are here, how many of them are there, what habitats are they in, things like that. Uh, and so for that, so what we've been doing for the last seven years or so uh, is we've been using acoustic monitoring devices um, that have a, a highly specialized ultrasonic microphone. And so we put those out in different areas of the park and we can listen for bats that are going by. Um, you can kind of tell species to a certain extent using that. Uh, you can get behaviors out of that. Maybe something for bear, uh, bird lovers to do because they're, they, you know, they're listening for species um, uh, by their song, maybe we can have them start to listen for bats. Certainly, yeah. Um, so you're not going to be able to hear them in that way, because right. outside of our hearing range, right. generally. But yeah, you look at the sonographs and yeah, you, you can uh, it. distinguish them based off of that. And they do actually have the same devices you can use for birds. Uh, so, so we've been doing that for a yeah. while. And then this year, we branched out a little bit. We actually started doing a little bit of capture as well. Um, so we were capturing some of the little brown bats and uh, taking measurements on them, looking at sex ratios in the colonies, looking at reproductive ratios in the colonies. Um, and then also, so this is the first chance to really ground truth what species we have. We did only find little brown bats okay. um, so far. Sounds like uh, a song. Uh, little, little brown, brown bats. bats yeah. uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and then we also put, um, we put a little band on their forearm. Hmm. Um, it slides up and down over the wing, so it's not pinching too hard or anything like that. But uh, that allows us to track uh, You can look at movement, you can look at lifespan. That's how that 30 year old bat was found, or that's how they, that's how they found out that it lived to at least 30 was that a bat had been banded. And then 30 years later, they caught it again and uh, wow. were able to track that band number and, and figure out how old it was. So, so where in the park are you doing this research? Cause it's mm -hmm. not a small park. Yeah, 4.1 million acres. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it relatively inaccessible. That's one of the one of the challenges that we have. Um, the acoustic monitoring has been in uh, Brooks Camp, uh, Lake Camp, uh, the Nonbinic Cabin, Analik Bay, Swick Shack Bay, Fury's Cabin. So we've got them. We've got them kind of all over the park in various spots, but areas that we are regularly going anyway. Uh, next year, I'm hoping to branch out. Um, there's a couple of new areas. I'm interested in looking that are not near any of our structures or anything. I want to start looking at some of the areas away from human structures to see how they're using the landscape um, outside of our buildings. Yeah, I mean, 
would you think that that um, behavior would be significantly different or that um, the physiology would be different? Um, I don't know that I don't know that the behavior or physiology would be all that different. I think that the distribution will be different. So buildings are a, a wonderful place for bat maternity colonies. Um, it's another thing a lot of people don't don't realize about bats. So so little browns they'll have uh, in the summer they go to the females will all go to what we call maternity colonies, uh, and the males will just kind of oftentimes be off or sing more on their own, um, not in big groups. And in the winter they go into what we call hibernacula. Uh, which is the, you know, these are what people think of in the southeast, the big caves and stuff like that, that you get a whole bunch of bats inside there. Um, the, the ones that we're getting in all of our buildings here are largely females in these maternity colonies. So they're, they're there to reproduce and have their pups. Um, I expect when we get away from the buildings, we'll find much smaller colonies. Uh, buildings are a really wonderful habitat for them. Keep a good temperature. Um, nice and protected, it keeps them away from predators. So it's a great spot for them uh, in the summer. When we get away from buildings, they're gonna be using tree roosts, um, rock crevices, anything they can find really. A lot of them will just kind of go behind the bark and trees and stuff, um, inside snapped off branches uh, where you get hollows and stuff. Uh, the bats will be in there as well. And I expect we'll find them in some lower numbers. So um, I'm gonna wait till the plane goes by so that I don't have to shout anymore. Thank you, Blake. So, um, so I know um, where my office is oh. in Brooks Camp. We have bat boxes yes. there. Are there places where visitors to Brooks Camp might find bat boxes? There are a lot of bat boxes at Brooks Camp, actually, um, on various buildings. So. Throughout the years, we have at times attempted to get bats out of our buildings. Uh, and when we do so, in order to avoid displaced without anywhere to go and then and, and dying because they don't have any cover, um, what we do is before we do the exclusions, we'll put up bat houses uh, on the exterior of the buildings so that the bats can then move into those and they'll have some place to go. So uh, if you're walking around Brooks Camp, um, just kind of look around. I think you'll find the many of the buildings have bat houses on them. Yeah, I, I can hear them from our office and I really enjoy that sound. It's nice to have, when you're staring at a computer all day, it's nice to have the sound of life yeah, near yeah. you. Uh, so occasionally there are bears that we hear, but it's nice to, to hear the bats. So, um, so there are all these misconceptions about bats. Why do we want bats in our lives? Why should someone who's watching, yeah. who lives in Missouri or uh, Idaho want bats? Okay. Uh, I'll give you a couple of reasons. One, uh, so there are lots of bats that are in colonies, just the same way that birds or butterflies or anything else uh, is a pollinator. So there are a lot of species that, that help um, a lot of the native native plants out there. Second reason, and I hate to invoke this one because you know we need our bugs as well. Um, but if you don't like bugs, then you love bats. <laughs> Where have they been all summer? We've had so many bugs. Our, our, yeah, we we have a plentiful supply of uh, of bugs, um, and the bats, you know, they do their best. But uh, we'd need we'd need probably several million more of them. I <laughs> bring them on, bring them on. I'd rather have bats than bugs. Uh, sorry, sorry, people who love bugs out there. Okay, great. So, um, okay, I'm getting information from uh, Felicia here, who's helping us out off screen. Um, so, okay, so you've given us some good reasons why we should be interested in bats. I and mean, flying the, bears. Flying bears. And also, the biggest reason you should care about them is they're incredible wild. I mean, if you care about diversity of wildlife, like they're awesome animals and they're adorable. If you are like, I mean, go Google pictures, close-ups of bats. Oh, they are cute. Uh, man, look at it. Look at like a Townsend's big-eared bat. Adorable. Absolutely adorable. Well, uh, you know that they're going to do that. And they I, should. They should. <laughs> so, so uh, Michael, all this is really fascinating. And I'm sure we have a, a bunch of questions from viewers. So if the wonderful people at Explore who are supporting us out there could... Um, put up some questions, we'll try and answer. How did we learn so much about bear biology and physiological processes that bears undergo, such as hyperphagia or the number of heartbeats per minute?
minute when they are in hibernation? Did we learn about these processes from bears in captivity or in the wild? I'll wait for the plane to go by too. <laughs> it's that hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's been research that's been going on with uh, with brown bear and a lot of different animals physiology in hibernation for a very long time. Uh, uh, you asked about captivity versus the wild. We had data from both captivity and the wild. So where I did my PhD at Washington State University, there they uh, have this brown bear research facility there. Um, and we've done a lot of that work in that facility. Uh, Fairbanks has a captive black bear facility. There's a few different locations in the U.S. with captive black bear facilities. Uh, I apologize, I'm not as familiar with locations outside of the U.S. And what they're like. uh, yeah, we've got quite a few different captive locations, but then a lot of it is wild bears. So the Scandinavian group that I mentioned. Yeah, so many um, from Scandinavia. Yeah, they've got a really interesting research program. Um, so they actually, they're the only ones who do a lot of denning work with brown bears in the wild. Uh, because going into a brown bear den is a pretty dangerous prospect. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, Mike Fitz might try it. Maybe. Maybe. maybe yeah. Maybe. Uh, in, so in in Europe, European brown bears have, are pretty different behaviorally than, than brown bears in the United States and in North America, uh, which helps a little bit. Uh, but then there's also, and I... I uh, have never I have never been on site while they've been doing this work, so I can only speak to what I've read about it. Um, I'm gonna wait a minute again because we've got another plane going by here. Uh, yes. it's, it's rush hour at Brooks Camp. Yep. So um, so my understanding of what they'll do there is uh, they're only working with sub bears, so they're not going in on any of the big males or anything like that. And my understanding is that what happens is basically they've got a big metal grate, and they'll go up and they'll throw it over the entrance to the den, and they have a person stand on each of the four corners of the grate, while another person um, uses a jab stick to dart the, to dart the bear. Uh, and they only do the subadults because the subadults at that point are maybe not able to lift the grate plus the four people standing on top of it. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Whereas the adult bears probably could. So, so yeah, so they only work with subadults in that one, but they, um, they've done some really interesting stuff. I mean, they get all sorts of, and you know, you draw blood and you can look at all sorts of different things that, uh, that tell you a lot about hibernation, but then they've also done uh, implantable heart rate monitors. Mm. Um, We did those at WSU as well, um, but their ability to do it on wild bears has provided a lot of insight. Um, So uh, they're just a little, it's about the size of a flash drive, um, and it goes just under the skin, essentially, uh, very minor little surgery to insert it. Um, And you can get all sorts of information on body temperature, heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, Really fantastic devices that give us a lot of information about bears. Great. Next question. Any hope of ever doing another attempt at DNA samples? Uh, great question. I would be interested in continuing the DNA work. Um, I think that there's a lot of value as long-term monitoring to do uh, to do the genetic work. There are some challenges at Katmai. Um, in order to really do good population uh, monitoring with this, you'd want to do, we wouldn't, wouldn't want it to just be Brooks Camp. We'd want to be looking broader right. than Brooks Camp. And access is a really big challenge. Mm-hmm. Most places where you do these broad scale genetic monitoring, uh, you have problems. Uh, <laughs> and so they can put out, all over the landscape, they can put out um, bait stations and hair snares, and they can get samples from a lot of different bears that way. Here, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have the roads. If we really want to hit the, uh, you know, an unbiased sample of the landscape, um, it would require a lot of helicopter work, which is very expensive and also not something that we generally like to do in the wilderness. Um, well, yeah. And I, you know, I don't think bears would be very used to that helicopter noise either. Well, so in, in what we would be doing is we'd be setting up hair snare stations uh, and okay. then, uh, so you leave it out there as bears come by, they're going to rub on it leave hair. not be the biopsy yarding where we can tell exactly what bears come but outside of Brooks Camp, it doesn't really matter if I can see what bear it is because I'm not going to know what bear that is. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, if you want to make an eel, though, you might. Know. 
if we went to McNeil, yeah, there'd be some possibility. Um, I don't see McNeil going to the house yarding, but it's possible. I don't know. I've never talked to him about it. We, we've we have, have we'll have ask, yeah, we'll have to ask Nick and Beth. Uh, we, have, we have some friends there now. Yeah. Um, but okay. uh, yeah, it'd be it would be it would be tricky. But I am in favor of uh, of continuing it as long term monitoring. Okay. So we have time for one more question. Is there a particular reason they don't use tracking devices and tag bears? Here, for example. Here. Um, so, like I said, we did it a few years ago on the coast. There's nothing that says that we won't in the future. We were looking at that we wanted to look into. I mean, we talked about those like monitors. Monitor. I'm pretty interested in trying to use those devices on the bears. Um, because I really like to look at. Uh, so heart rate variability is a pretty good indicator of stress, um, and I'd like to look at physiological stress from a lot of different events. From um, you know, how does the stress of being at the falls around all of those other bears compare to the stress of walking under the bridge when there's a bunch of people around, or going through camp and being chased by me and my team? Yeah, or, it's got to be a lot of stress. I mean, potentially, I mean, we're yeah. trying to stress them out a little bit there, uh, or I mean, the stress of being on the beach when a plane is taking off or landing or something like that. Uh, we may find that being at the falls with other bears is the most stressful thing. That's far more stressful than anything that we are doing. Or we may find that things that we're doing are far more stressful. Uh, and that would be really useful to know. That would be really useful for the parks management yeah. and our relationship with yeah. bears. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, we had some good questions. I'm sure there are many more. Um, and. Um, you can uh, put them in the, the spreadsheet and um, we'll try and get those questions answered at another time. I really want to thank um, Dr. Saxon for uh, joining us today um, here at Brooks, um, at Brooks Camp and on the river. We, and through the bear camps, we really look so, at bears so much as individuals, right? And we're watching their individual behavior, but we're not thinking about them as a population as much and it's so fascinating to hear from michael the the broader research that most bear biologists and wildlife biologists do um on a population level sure. so um it's food for thought for for all of us and um and appreciate everyone joining us and thank you so much my and, pleasure thank you all and never stop learning Thank you.